good evening uh, uh, friends and colleagues uh, today we are going to discuss the concept of stress and strain the outline of the talk is the we are going to start with the basics of the pulmonary mechanics pertaining to our topic and then a brief overview of the usefulness of measuring the transpulmonary pressure introduction to the concept of stress and strain and some related important topics and then a brief uh, literature review of pediatric considerations this is a schematic presentation of lung and alveolus. This is the visceral pleura. This is the parietal pleura. This is the chest wall, which is adherent to the parietal pleura. And this is the diaphragm. So normally, uh, this is the intraalveolar pressure and uh, also known as airway pressure, which is displayed on the screen of the ventilator monitor. We see as bloody pressure and uh, positive and expected pressure, which are displayed on the ventilator monitor. So this is what is the pressure which is there. At least we expect that to be. We are going to discuss that further in this lecture. This is the intrapleural pressure, which is the pressure in between the parietal and the visceral pleura. When a lung is kept outside, it has got a natural tendency to collapse on itself. So that means. Uh, uh, the lung has a natural tendency to collapse and two-thirds of this tendency is because of the surface tension inside the alveolar walls and one-third of this tendency is because of the elasticity of the lung parenchyma due to the elastin fibers. And the chest wall has a natural tendency to expand outwardly and uh, that is why the outward pulling force over the parietal flora and the collapsing force over the visceral flora creates a negative intrapleural pressure of minus three to minus four centimeters of water at resting stage during expiration. During expiration, the diaphragm collapse, uh, contracts and this pulls the parietal pleura away from the visceral pleura. And at the peak of inspiration, generally this negativity goes up to minus seven to minus nine centimeters of water. And as we know, as per the Boyle's law, when the pressure drops, the volume is inversely proportional, so volume expands. So this expansion of the volume leads to entrainment of the air inside the alveoli, and there is an inspiration and the air entering into the alveoli. So this is the pressure volume loop of uh, lung compliance. This is the pressure volume loop of chest compliance, and we can clearly see that uh, the chest wall is far more compliant than the lungs. And this is the average uh, pressure volume loop of the chest wall plus lung compliance. And this is the functional residual capacity. So normally the pleural pressure is always negative as we saw already. It becomes equal to atmospheric pressure during penetrating chest injury. It becomes positive during tension pneumothorax, pleural effusion, intra-abdominal pressures, uh, hypertensions or spinal or thoracic cage malformations. At resting stage, as we already saw, the during expiration, minus three to minus four centimeters of intrapleural pressure is present. And when we intubate somebody, then we need to apply a certain pressure during expiration to counter that minus three to minus four centimeters of intrapleural pressure. And that pressure should be around three to four centimeters of water to counter the negative intrapleural pressure. And that is the positive and expiratory pressure. This is the continuous distending pressure which is applied during expiration to counter the negative interrupted pressure and to keep the alveoli open. During mechanical ventilation, we have these certain numbers that is peak pressure and positive, positive and expiratory pressure and bloody pressures. These pressures is the required to expand the lung. This bloody pressure and the PIP, these are the pressures which are required to expand the lung as well as the chest wall. So these pressures are not the pressures only uh, required to open uh, the lungs or expand the lungs. They are basically to expand the lungs as well as the chest wall. That we need to understand. So uh, the transpulmonary trans pressure is the pressure which is across the alveolar or alveolar capillary membrane. And uh, it is the actual pressure which is used for expanding the lungs. And it is because it is a trans a mural pressure across the alveolar capillary membrane. It is basically a difference between the airway pressure inside the alveoli and the pleural pressure, which is in between the parietal and the visceral pleura. 
And as we know, the airway pressure is the pressure which is displayed on the ventilator screen, while the pleural pressure is measured. And we can't measure the pleural pressure directly in living human beings. So we measure the esophageal pressure and uh, take it as a surrogate for the pleural pressure. In the landmark article uh, on driving pressure by Marcelo Amato, they had used the calculated driving pressure by taking the difference between pleural pressure and positive end expected pressure. So this pleural pressure and positive end expected pressure was the pressure which was actually displayed on the screen of the mechanical ventilation. And in the editorial of the same journal where the Amato's publication was made, it was remark the remark was made that they actually did not measure the transpulmonary pressure, the actual pressure which is required to expand the lungs, and instead they used the alveolar airway pressure, which is uh, the pressure required for opening of the lungs as well as the chest wall. And this was further confirmed in the 2008 uh, study by Chibula et al., where they had done this study on 80 patients from different clinical situations like post-surgical patients, medical disease, acute lung injury, and ARDS patients under which underwent a PEEP trial at 5 and 15 centimeters of water at uh, 6, 8, 10, and 12 ml per kg tidal volume. Transpulmonary pressure was measured by esophageal pressure monitoring and strain was calculated by a ratio that is tidal volume divided by functional residual capacity. We'll look at this in uh, further slides. So when they did that, they actually observed that these numbers which are mentioned on the ventilator screen, the pleural pressure and the peak pressures, pleural pressures and the PWEP, these pressures actually do not correlate with actual transpulmonary pressure, which is the pressure which is actually needed to expand the lungs. They found these pressures which are displayed on the ventilator screen, the, that is also called as airway pressure, are poor surrogates for the transpulmonary pressure. So this can be given, understood by this particular example, for example, in a uh, ventilation of a child with normal chest wall compliance, suppose you have a pleural pressure of 25 centimeters of water displayed on the screen of the mechanical ventilator. And at the same time, there is uh, during that positive pressure ventilation, your pleural pressure is say plus four during inspiration. Then when you're calculating transpulmonary pressure, it will be 25 minus plus four, that is 21 centimeters of water. However, if there is a problem of chest wall edema, obesity, or intra-abdominal hypertension, or severe ascites, in all these conditions, then you will have a problem of poor chest wall compliance. And even though if your pleural pressure displayed on the screen of the ventilator is 25, you will have a positive pleural pressure of plus 15 centimeters of water because of uh, poor chest wall compliance. And then when you're calculating the transpulmonary pressure, it will be 25 minus plus or plus 15, that is 10 centimeters of water. So what it means is the pleural pressure which is displayed on the screen of the ventilator is 25, but the actual pressure which is used to uh, expand the lungs is just 10 centimeters of water. So the same thing was dis described by Chimula et al. that the airway pleural pressure of 30 uh, corresponded to the transpulmonary pressure of as low as 10 centimeters of water to uh, as high as 28 centimeters of water. Uh, in this uh, 2004 uh, paper by Grishani Gatunani also, they showed that if you have a normal chest wall compliance and with the lung elastance to total elastance ratio of 0.7, when you apply a pleural pressure of say 30 centimeters of water, you will have most of the pressure here in this case, 25 centimeters of water used up in opening the lungs and only five centimeters is used up in expanding the chest wall and then the transpulmonary pressure is around 21 or 22. So it is not that bad. So you have a pleural pressure of 30 and transpulmonary pressure of around 21, 22. But if you have a proposed, suppose a poor chest wall compliance situation like ascites or chest wall edema, and you apply same 30 centimeters of uh, airway pleural pressure, then only 15 centimeters is used in opening the lungs and remaining 15 centimeters is wasted in overcoming the chest wall elastance. And then in such case, when you measure the transpulmonary pressure, it will be somewhere like six. So your airway pressure displayed on the screen of the ventilator at, at it will show a pleural pressure of 30, but the actual pressure which is used to the opening of the lungs is just six centimeters of water. So that is the fallacy. 
of using only airway pressure uh, when particularly you have a poor chest wall compliance. What about the positive industrial pressure or PEEP? So the same thing happens for PEEP also when you have obesity, ascites or chest wall edema. And in that case, suppose you have a positive industrial pressure displayed on the ventilator as 12, which is quite high for pediatric age group patients. And um, in because of poor chest wall compliance, if the pleural pressure is say 15, then if you measure the transplant pressure during expiration, it will be 12 minus plus 15, that is minus three. So even though your PEEP is quite high, that is 12, still your transplant pressure is in minus, in negative number of minus three. And that means there will still be some atelectasis at the lungs. And in such cases, you will have to increase the PEEP further. Uh, so in such situation where you have a pleural pressure of 15 because of poor chest wall compliance, you need to titrate your PEEP above the pleural pressure of 15, that is 18, if you keep PEEP, then you will uh, transplant pressure during expiration will be 18 minus plus 15, that is three centimeters, and this will keep the alveoli open. So this is how a transplant pressure measurement will help us titrating the PEEP appropriately and setting the PEEP above the PEEP, uh, above the pleural pressure, which is measured through esophageal pressure monitoring. Indeed, the studies have shown the benefits of measuring the esophageal pressure. Like uh, in this study, they have shown that uh, ECMO criteria uh, and uh, the, they measured the transplanted pressure with severe ADS and increased the PEEP until the transplanted pressure was uh, 25 centimeters of water. 50% of this patient responded to an increase in the airway pressure and did not require VV ECMO. And the recent study in 2019 also supported use of transplanted pressure and showed that transpulmonary pressure guided open lung concept significantly reduced the need for ECMO. And uh, as we saw earlier, transpulmonary pressure can be measured during inspiration as well as expiration. So during inspiration, you can take blood pressure, uh, which is displayed on the ventilator screen, that is airway blood pressure, minus the pleural pressure measured at the peak inspiration, and calculate the transpulmonary pressure at inspiration. And during expiration, you can take positive industrial pressure from the mental screen and minus the pleural pressure during expiration. So just like driving pressure, which is difference between the pleural pressure and positive industrial pressure, the transpulmonary driving pressure can be calculated as transpulmonary pressure during inspiration minus transpulmonary pressure during expiration. Uh, there are studies actually which have shown the benefits of this particular transpulmonary driving pressure concept, and they have shown that if your transpulmonary driving pressure is kept below 10, it appeared to be useful in reducing the ventilator induced lung injury. This is EpiVent 1 trial, which was a pilot study uh, published in 2008 NAGM, uh, which showed the usefulness of measuring the titrating the PEEP as per the esophageal pressure monitoring and improving the outcomes uh, in, in the form of oxygenation and compliance. But the subsequent EpiVent 2, 2 trial, which was published in JAMA in 2019, which was an RCT of over 200 patients across USA and Canada, um, showed no much significant difference in death and ventilator days uh, when esophageal pressure monitoring was used. Um, but in this particular trial, ep one 2 trial, they used high PPFIO2 table, while in pp one 1 trial, they had used low PPFIO2 table. So that was an important differentiating factor and probably because they used high PEEP FIO2 table, the PEEP were already on the higher side, and that's why maybe they could not find any benefit of using esophageal pressure monitoring. These are two important papers which I would recommend uh, the audience to note down and go through them. These two articles have uh, described very nicely all the important pros and cons and technical aspects of esophageal pressure monitoring. So you can go through them and uh, see how sufficient pressure monitoring is done. In India, uh, nutriment catheter is still not licensed for use. And uh, there are other lot of issues with use of uh, sufficient pressure monitoring in children. And uh, that's why some other modifications have been devised. For like, for example, in this particular video, uh, we can see uh, a normal suction catheter is connected, size six or size seven. It's connected to a pressure transducer, which is connected to a cardiac monitor. And uh, the transducer is connected to a 50 ml syringe, which is pushing air. 
at a rate of around two per minute. And uh, then you can see when the suction catheter is uh, positioned strategically in the esophagus in the junction of upper two third and lower one third, you can see the inspiratory and expiratory pleural pressures, uh, basically esophageal pressures, uh, which is five inspiratory and zero expiratory. So this is how you can measure, but there are a lot of technical issues even in this technique because of secretions that catheter keeps getting blocked and many times the readings are not accurate. Now we'll come to the concept of stress and strain. Uh, the term stress and strain are used in the medical field to understand injury during mechanical uh, ventilation uh, to the lungs. The stress is the distribution of internal forces per unit of of area in, induced by an external force applied to a specific material. This is a very technical definition of stress. Basically, stress is um, the pressure which is applied on the lungs and the fibers of the skeleton and with an equal opposite uh, pressure, uh, that is tension. So basically, stress is transpulmonary pressure, which we already discussed in last so many slides. So the actual pressure which is applied over the alveoli to distend the lungs is uh, the stress or transpulmonary pressure and it is measured as a difference between the airway pressure and the pleural pressure and the pleural pressure is used is measured via esophageal pressure monitoring and the strain is basically the elastic fibers undergoing stretching because of the application of stress so basically it is a change in volume compared to the initial volume and the initial volume is generally the frc so the change in volume over the top of frc is normally tidal volume so the strain is vt divided by FRC. This is a schematic representation of capillary endothelium, and um, this is the collagen type 4 fibers which hold the capillary endothelium and epithelium, alveolar epithelium together. And uh, this is our alveolar epithelium. So, microscopically, it looks like this. So, you have a, a capillary alveolar epithelium, and below is the capillary endothelium, and it is bonded in between by the lamina densa of collagen type 4 fibers and if there is an increase in the capillary pressure because of conditions like pulmonary hypertension or if there is excess amount of uh, lung inflation then in both situations there will be excess amount of stretching on this alveolocapillary membrane and that leads to the problem of stress and strain in the system so what happens is there will be a plasma membrane unfolding because of this stretching increased plasma membrane intermolecular distancing and intracellular lipid trafficking to the plasma membrane and plasma membrane stress failure. There are different mechanisms described like uh, damage to the calcium channels over the cell membrane of the alveolar and endothelial cell membranes, cell membrane disruption and disruption of the integrin molecules leading to disruption of the cytokine skeleton system of the alveolar capillary membrane. All these things leading to injury injury to the endothelium precedes the injury to the epithelium. These studies have shown that when your transpulmonary pressure is roughly around 7, there are very few number of breaks per uh, high power field. But when your transpulmonary pressure is around 30, you will have a significantly higher number of breaks per high power field. And when the transpulmonary pressure is around 50, then a very high number of breaks you will see in the alveolar capillary membrane per high power field. Uh, so stress and strain are related to each other mathematically stress is equal to k multiplied by strain and as we discussed the strain is nothing but vt divided by frc and k is the lung specific elastance lung specific elastance can be it become a one uh, uh, it, when uh, the vt becomes equal to frc so the, when the vt is equal to frc the lung specific elastance can become equal to stress so it is basically k or lung specific elastance is the pressure required to double the size of the baby lung we can say uh, for example in this patient a you have a situation where you are ventilating the patient with optimal whatever is recommended safe tidal volume of 6 ml per kg at a certain frc and in patient b the same set safe so-called safe tidal volume is going on but now you have done some recruitment maneuver or peep titration or proning and with this you have opened up some alveoli and by that what you have done is you have improved the frc so we know mathematically strain is equal to vt divided by frc and when the frc has increased with your recruitment maneuver or proning 
or uh, good peep titration. What we are doing is we are actually increasing the number of this denominator and that means mathematically the strain is reduced and when the strain is reduced the stress also reduces so for the same tidal volume ventilation just by performing good recruitment and improving frc we can reduce the strain and stress of the system at zero peep we have a certain frc and when we are ventilating at a certain tidal volume then we have this tidal volume and frc and we'll take a ratio of that and we get strain this is the total lung capacity on the top, which is roughly 2.5 to 3 times the FRC. These are the normal things. And when we apply a positive end distributed pressure in the system, what we are doing is we are basically introducing a certain peep volume. And when we introduce a peep volume, then we have an end expiratory lung volume, which is a combination of FRC and peep volume. And we have a VT plus peep volume divided by FRC giving us global strain and we have end inspiratory lung volume here and these are all good qualities of a good healthy peep we can see here very nicely a good healthy peep introduces some peep volume which is required for alveolar recruitment and uh, alveolar recruitment will improve the oxygenation will improve carbon dioxide elimination and will improve the lung compliance Although it may have increased the global strain to some extent, but the benefits are more than harms. And here you can see with a good healthy PEEP, the end inspiratory lung volume is significantly away from total lung capacity. So it's a win-win situation all the way. And uh, these are good things in a good PEEP, healthy PEEP. Proti et al. ventilated 29 healthy peaks for 54 hours, producing a, a strain of 0.45 to 3.3. They found that features of ventilator induced lung injury uh, damage in the form of increased lung weight, deteriorating gas exchange, and uh, lung mechanics developed only when the strain was 1.5 to 2. So, all the pigs with strain below 1.5 actually survived. This is an important finding. So, when the strain is less than 1.5 inch animals, survival was noticed. In fact, in 2008 stimulus article also, they found a linear relationship between strain and stress. And they found that when the strain is around 2 to 2.2, it was corresponding to a stress of around 25 to 26 centimeters of water. And in 2017's paper by Catinoni also, they demonstrated that ch the changes of biodrama are evident when the strain is roughly around 1.5, which corresponds to the transplanted pressure of around 24 centimeters of water, provided the patient has normal chest wall elastance, that is lung elastance to total elastance ratio of 0.7. What it means in, uh, to us is if you don't have facility of measuring uh, lung stress or strain, you don't have esophageal pressure monitoring, you don't have facility to measure FRC, you don't need to worry if your chest wall elastance is normal, all you need to do is keep your blood pressure below 28. When you keep your blood pressure below 28, automatically your transpulmonary inspiratory pressure will be below 24, 25 and your strain in the lung will be below 1.5 or 1.2 and this will be a lung protective strategy for your patient. Proti et al. again in another study on 76 uh, pigs demonstrated that ventilator induced lung injury was more likely when the threshold of inspiratory capacity was breached. Thus emphasizing the fact that volumetric threshold for ventilator induced lung injury coincide with anatomical limits of lung expansion. Although we know that animal models, you, you can't directly apply on the human subjects, but we can safely assume that unphysiological stress and strain are achieved when the lungs are ventilated at a lung volume, which is the size of the total lung capacity. And uh, we already discussed total lung capacity is 2.5 to 3 times the FRC. This emphasizes the fact that positive end exclusion pressure is protective against Vitti, Willi, or ventilator and his lung injury only when the tidal volume is lower and not the otherwise. If your tidal volume is not uh, in a safe zone, then PEEP may not be protective. So we'll go back to our example where we already discussed the uh, all good uh, qualities of a healthy PEEP. Healthy PEEP may increase the global strain by introducing PEEP volume, but it will have beneficial effects of reducing compliance, improving carbon dioxide elimination, improving oxygenation, by producing alveolar recruitment due to introduction of end expiratory lung volume and it is keeping end inspiratory lung volume safely away from total lung capacity. 
However, when the PEEP is excessive, excess amount of PEEP will introduce excess amount of PEEP volume. This will lead to excess amount of strain in the system. This will also push in inspiratory volume closer to total lung capacity as we can see here. So if this patient is ventilated at 30 beats per minute, 30 times uh, it is going to hit the total lung capacity and this will all lead to more incidence and more risk of volume trauma or ventilator induced lung injury. So we can clearly see that optimally applied PEEP may prevent ventilator induced lung injury, particularly when tidal volume is lower so that your total lung capacity is away from the uh, end, end inspiratory lung volume is away from the total lung capacity. Also, higher PEEP can be harmful when the global strain is higher due to excess amount of PEEP volume because too much of PEEP, that means too much of PEEP volume and leading to again pushing the end inspiratory lung volume towards total lung capacity. So we can see PEEP has a U-shaped relation. Optimum PEEP work, PEEP works by keeping the lung open during inspiration as well as expiration and preventing cyclic inflation and deflation. And lower levels, uh, it prevents atelic trauma, but at higher levels with increased static strain and volume trauma. In the lungs of ARDS, we have a BB lung, which is the lung which is ventilated at end expiratory lung volume, that is FRC plus PEEP volume. We have a recruitable lung, that is the lung which can be recruited safely with safe positive industrial pressure without compromising hemodynamics and worsening ventilator and lung injury. So a good recruitment is a recruitment where or alveolar recruitment is a recruitment where all the alveoli open and remain open during inspiration as well as during expiration and improve the compliance, improve the carbon dioxide elimination and improve the oxygenation. That is a sign of good alveolar recruitment. But the third category also will be there in the expression where there is a non-recruitable lung. Here, the part of the lung which is totally non-recruitable, no matter what PP you apply, or it may be able, you may be able to recruit, but only at application of harmful PEEP, which will be unacceptable. So the excess amount of PEEP will introduce, as we discussed, excess amount of PEEP volume, leading to very high end inspiratory lung volume, touching the total lung capacity. Or there may be a third situation uh, where you may have only tidal recruitment. That means the alveoli will remain open only during inspiration, and they will close during expiration. So this is also not a good, um, uh, type of recruitment. It is called tidal recruitment. Such a recruitment may improve oxygenation to some extent, but will not result in good improvement in compliance or carbon dioxide elimination. So as uh, we know, lung recruitment does not improve oxygenation. It only opens up the alveoli and keeps them open during inspiration and expiration. While oxygenation will improve eventually only when the perfusion of the recruited lung also improves. So uh, only opening the alveoli is one part. The oxygenation also must improve. So finally improve the uh, 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 oxygenation. Uh, that is the thing. True recruitment, as we discussed already, should improve lung compliance, better carbon dioxide clearance, and improvement in oxygenation. This is called alveolar recruitment. More improvement in oxygenation in absence of improvement in compliance and carbon dioxide clearance is not true alveolar recruitment. So only improvement in oxygenation without improvement in carbon dioxide elimination or lung compliance is not an alveolar recruitment. It is basically a tidal recruitment, you may say. So improvement in oxygenation may happen without improvement in carbon dioxide clearance and lung compliance by mechanisms like Henry's law. In Henry's law, if there is an increase in the mean airway pressure, there will be increase in the uh, partial pressure of oxygen in the blood. And uh, similarly, because of the application of PEEP, there is an increase in the uh, right ventricular afterload, which will reduce the blood flow across the pulmonary shunts and temporarily may improve oxygenation. Actually, there is not much of alveolar recruitment, but oxygenation still improves. So these are the mechanisms whereby the oxygenation may improve, but you are still not getting a true alveolar recruitment. So ventilator induced lung injury can be minimized by optimizing the strain that is optimizing your positive end expiratory pressure and tidal volume against available constructural capacity. Also, you can reduce VLE by optimizing lung stress. 
that is inspiratory transpulmonary pressure, expiratory transpulmonary pressure, transpulmonary driving pressures. And uh, you can also apply these two concepts of optimizing stress and strain at an optimi optimized respiratory rate and flow. So as you can see, there are so many pressure and non-pressure parameters involved now, flow, respiratory rate, pressures, volumes, and positive and respiratory pressure. So when all these pressure and non-pressure parameters of energy load are taken and then they are multiplied by respiratory rate and expressed in joules per unit of time, then that is called as a concept of mechanical power. This concept was first introduced by Luciani Gattinoni in 2016. Uh, the equation basically is derived from equation of motion and it has got three component, the elastic component, the resistive component and the static component. And when all these components are multiplied by respiratory rate and expressed in terms of joule per minute, it is mechanical power. Apart from tidal volume causing lung injury by increasing the strain overall, there is also possibility of local factors within the lungs that may locally multiply the impact of applied pressure or tidal volume with the resultant increase in the local stress and strain. These are called local stress raisers. They are usually occurring at the interface between the regions of different elasticity. So particularly between normal lungs and the atelectatic lung. And that means lung inhomogeneity will promote development of stress raisers. So the idea will be to remove the lung homogeneity, inhomogeneity and make the lung homogeneous by recruitment maneuvers like prone positioning or PEEP optimization or judicious use of recruitment maneuver. And all these things will ultimately reduce lung inhomogeneity. They make the lung more homogeneous and reduce the number of stress raisers. So if a lung has more proportion of recruitable areas, those areas shall absorb higher energies and result in less lung injury at same mechanical power. Uh, like for in this example, the Mead et al. actually showed that if you apply a 30 centimeters of water of transpulmonary pressure, but at the junction of normal lung and atelectatic lung, there can be a local stress raiser leading to a local pressure of around 140 centimeters of water. So your transfer pressure of used is 30, but local stress raisers have increased the pressure to 140 centimeters of water. That's the power of local stress raisers causing ventilator to lung injury and you should be careful about it. And available recruitable lung is important because the more availability of recruitment lung, less need of mechanical power and less availability of recruitment lung means more prone to ventilator and lung injury. Now coming to the last part of this talk, pediatric considerations. The children are different from adults as we all know. In infants, the chest wall elastance is higher than the lung elastance. Chest wall elastance is also higher in children with neuromuscular disorders. Uh, the, during infancy, the chest wall is nearly three times more compliant than normal lungs. By the end of usually second year of life, the chest wall stiffens and increases to the point that chest wall and lung wall Lungs are nearly equal to the, uh, equally compliant as in adult life. Um, high chest wall compliance in, in, in uh, infants less than two years puts the infants at risk of lower end expiratory lung volume because of the higher chest wall elastance, the chest wall tends to fall back over the lungs during every expiration. And uh, infants actively augment this end expiratory lung volume during the respiratory distress conditions through the mechanism of denting by using the laryngeal adductors and diaphragmatic muscles. As the chest wall stiffens, uh, increases by the uh, stiffness increases by the age of two to three cent years, this uh, allows the child to maintain end respiratory lung volume passively. The ventilator induced lung injury mechanism uh, in pediatric age group also are different from adults. Infants are more prone for patient ventilator asynchrony because of smaller end respiratory lung volume, higher respiratory rates and variable breathing pattern. And infants also re, uh, uh, react to inflammatory uh, situations of the lung differently by inducing more elastin fiber production compared to uh, older children or adults where collagen fiber production is more. Uh, this is the only study on pediatric stress and strain which is published till now. And this was again by Chumulo et al. In 2016, this paper was published. Uh, same uh, Chumulo et al. had... Uh, 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 published the famous uh, study of stress and strain in adults in 2008. 
In this pediatric study, end expiratory lung volume stress and strain was measured in 10 normal and healthy children and 10 children with pediatric ARDS at two peeps of 4 and 12 centimeters of water and three tidal volumes of 8, 10 and 12 ml per kg. They showed that stress and strain and specific uh, lung elastance were significantly higher in uh, children with the ARDS compared to normal lungs. They also showed that end expiratory lung volume was significantly lower in pediatric ARDS patient and increased bone both groups after increasing the level of PEEP. Chest wall compliance was similar in the two groups. The, that means the children uh, in the Gimula et al. study did not have problem of chest wall edema, obesity, or ascites. Compliance of the lung and chest wall was not affected by the changes in the PEEP or tidal volume. However, the stress and strain significantly increased with PEEP. So this was a very important finding. They showed that the changes in PEEP did not change in compliance. Uh, however, the stress and strain significantly increased with PEEP. And uh, this uh, suggested that the stress and strain could be used as a better indicator for possible wheelie. The lung stress, although related to airway driving pressure, could not be predicted by the driving pressure. This is again an interesting finding. The st lung stress is nothing but transpulmonary um, uh, uh, pressure, quality pressure or transpulmonary PEEP. And it was not related to driving pressure, which is again an uh, important uh, pressure uh, difference between the platelet pressure and the PEEP. In fact, in their study, they found that the driving pressure of 14 to 16 correlated with uh, the stress uh, of 13 to 25 centimeters of water. In children with ARDS lung specific elastance significantly higher compared to uh, control group. Again, an important finding in this particular pediatric paper because in the adult study by Chimul et al., which was published in 2008, the lung specific elastance was same between the normal lung and pediatric uh, ARDS lung. And this again supports this concept or idea that children react differently to inflammatory insults to the lung compared to adults and inflammation, surfactant depletion, alterations, and uh, more elastin production compared to collagen production local edema, all these things may explain the differences between pediatric and adult lungs. Mathematically, if we look at uh, driving pressure and strain, they look similar as both are tidal volume titrated against something. Driving pressure is the tidal volume titrated against respiratory compliance, while the strain is the tidal volume titrated against the FRC. And uh, we can see the, the Gimula et al.'s finding that when the, there is an increase in the PEEP, it did not change the respiratory compliance, but it increased the end expiratory lung volume uh, through an increase in the PEEP volume. So probably the children had more of tidal recruitment than actual alveolar recruitment. And it highlights that the relationship between the driving pressure and the strain depends upon the amount of applied PEEP. So they look like same, but they are not same driving pressure and the strain are different entities. And uh, the impact of PEEP also will have variable effect on driving pressure and the strain. Assessment of the severity of the lung injury by using driving pressure can be erroneous if one does not consider at what PEEP the driving pressure was measured. This particular comment was actually uh, mentioned in the editorial of the New England Journal of Medicine uh, edition where Amato's paper was published. And it is very true because you may have a safe driving pressure of only 12, but if you are applying that driving pressure on a PEEP of zero, it is going to be harmful. Similarly, excess of high PEEP leading to high end expiratory lung volume is also not good. So you may have a driving pressure of only 12, which may be apparently safe, but if you are applying it at a very high PEEP leading to very high global strain and stress in the system, then it, that kind of PEEP is not acceptable. Uh, Chimula et al. showed that driving pressure could not be correlated with the amount of stress. This could be because the, the respiratory compliance is relatively high uh, uh, in patients with normal lung and mild ARDS, and one can have higher driving pressure even at lower stress and vice versa. And these things expose the critical limitations of using driving pressure in isolation as a guide to lung protective ventilation. For example, if you have a normal lung and you have a patient with ARDS with very poor uh, compliance, so if you have a very poor lung compliance, 
that means for a, a driving pressure of less than 15 you will have a very small amount of tidal volume to accommodate here but if your lungs are normal with very good lung volumes then you can have driving pressure less than 15 and still you can accommodate a lot of good amount of tidal volume even 8 to 10 ml per kg of tidal volume in such kind of lungs so this is uh, important thing to remember that uh, when you're monitoring driving pressure you have to look at what compliance is available and what tidal volume is available um, what, for delivery. Uh, because driving pressure is mainly to titrate the tidal volume as per available lung compliance. Although many people use driving pressure for peep titration, so when they say that when the peep is achieving least flirty pressure, least driving pressure, and uh, uh, best oxygenation, then I will uh, uh, stop titrating further. and. Uh, but you need, you need to understand that driving pressure is basically, basically a used uh, tool for titrating tidal volume against respiratory compliance. When you are using driving pressure for peep titration, we should be very careful because it all depends upon at what peep you are applying that driving pressure and uh, what is the underlying respiratory compliance and tidal volume. Any change in the tidal volume alters driving pressure irrespective of underlying peep. So, in Chimato at all study, they showed that PEEP did not change the driving pressure as PEEP did not affect respiratory compliance. Esophageal monitoring has many technical limitations in children, severely restricting its use in pediatric uh, intensive care unit even uh, across the developed countries, uh, underdeveloped countries and in developed countries. Uh, there are several limitations uh, uh, when it does not correlate it with the pleural pressure like it uh, relies on correct balloon position and gravitational pressure gradient. Esophageal balloon is closest to the lower lobe of the lung. Therefore, it may not reflect pleural pressure in other regions. Interpretation is pers uh, in the in person prone uh, position is not validated. Also, it can be affected by elastic recoil of the balloon, elastic recoil of the esophagus, active uh, esophageal contractions or it may be transmitted pressure from the surrounding structures. Structures. So there are so many limiters of esophageal pressure monitoring. And hence, some new techniques have come, like nitrogen multiple breathe wash in, wash out technique, which is used to be described as a reliable technique for measurement of end expiratory lung volume or FRC at zero end expiratory pressure. Once FRC can be measured, the strain can be calculated by tidal volume divided by FRC. In 2018, Ola Stinquist proposed a technique of steep step method to measure stress without using esophageal pressure monitoring at all. And we combined these two methods so, and uh, tried to do this particular study uh, last year. Uh, you know, this is an observational prospective study where we measured the end expiratory lung volume using the nitrogen multiple breath wash in wash out technique at the bedside and then we used peep step method to calculate the stress uh, we had total 41 or 42 patients eight children had normal lung 12 had pediatric acute respiratory disease syndrome and eight children had non parts lung disease this study is still not published it is unpublished but we just want to give you a glimpse of what's happening in this particular study. So uh, at zero PEEP, we applied 6 ml per kg of tidal volume and ventilated for some time. So we got our driving pressure at this zero PEEP. That is uh, one thing. And then we applied a PEEP which was equal to 60 per to 70% of the driving pressure at ZEEP. And this uh, uh, again was ventilated at around 8 ml per kg or 6 ml per kg tidal volume as earlier and now we had this peep high which is 70 to 80 percent of the uh, uh, earlier driving pressure and uh, then we have a delta peep delta peep is the difference between this peep high and zero peep so that's our delta peep now we also measured the end expirated lung volume at this particular peep high and after that we measured delta peep delta peep is the uh, uh, this thing the peep high minus uh, 
the zero p that is our delta p and uh, we have a delta e elv the e elv measured at peep high minus the frc which is the interstitial lung volume at the zero peep so this is your delta elv now elastance is exactly opposite to compliance so lung elastance is delta peep minus uh, divided by delta interstitial lung volume once you get lung elastance it's easy lung specific elastance is basically lung elastance multiplied by frc and as we know once we get lung specific elastance then we have to simply just multiply it by strain and we get our stress so in see there was uh, 41 patients during the study period and uh, 16 patients had normal lungs and uh, nine patients with non-drds uh, disease lung and 16 patients had drds lungs pf ratio y was uh, pf ratio was significantly lower and y was significantly higher in patients with drds and uh, FRC was significantly lower in patients with ARDS compared to normal lungs. There was a linear relationship uh, between the FRC and, FR and age. FRC increased by 0.8 times every month with an increase in the age in normal lungs. And uh, the single elastance to total elastance ratio of only 0.3 indicating that all of the children uh, of normal lung ARDS and non-ARDS lungs had uh, uh, normal chest wall elastance and nobody had any poor chest wall elastance issues. Uh, the All the results of the study cannot be discussed in this talk as it is still due for publication. Limitations are bedside measurement of FRC and indexpector lung volume using nitrogen multiple weight washing technique. Needs a lot of patients and there are still technical limitations. FIO2 must be below 65%, respiratory rate should be less than 35 per minute and uh, lung strain and its associated parameters like end inspirated lung volume to total lung capacity ratio are associated with severity of lung injury as far as what we have found and we feel that although there are technical limitations now but in future there may be better technologies available very soon uh, whereby we may be able to do a strain targeted uh, lung protective ventilation rather than going for esophageal pressure monitoring uh, techniques our knowledge on clinical utility of transplanted pressure, lung stress and strain is still in early stages. As of now, we cannot recommend that we must monitor transplanted pressure or strain targeted therapy for every child. But we can give a rough algorithm like if you have a diagnosis of ARDS, you provide basic lung protective ventilation strategies by keeping plenty pressure below 28 and uh, tidal volume of 4 to 8 ml per kg and optimize your PEEP. And if bloody pressure remains less than 28 to 30, then continue that ventilation and monitoring. But if your airway bloody pressure is going above 28 to 30, ask yourself whether there is a clinical suspicion of poor chest wall compliance like obesity, pleural effusion, chest wall deformity, intra-abdominal hypertension. And if you have yes to this uh, question, then you have a, a reason to start transplanted pressure monitoring. And if no, then you can just continue to monitor the way you were doing before for a bloody pressure more than 28 to 30 with normal chest wall elastance. You can consider proning, you can consider nitric oxide or HF HFOV or even ECMO. But uh, otherwise, you can go for transplanted pressure monitoring if there is a poor chest wall elastance. And even who knows, maybe in future, strain targeted therapy or calculate end expiratory lung volume by techniques like nitrogen multiple breath washing technique or electrical impedance tomography and then calculate end inspiratory lung volume to total lung elast uh, total lung capacity ratio and then follow lung protective ventilation from there on thank you very much